Salutations, everyone. Welcome back to another Total Warhammer 3 guide. I'm Lord Corm. And today we're going to be covering Cathay. So the guide will cover several different sections, all of which should be chaptered below. So you can skip to whichever one you would like to see. So we're going to cover the faction, how they play, what's unique about them. And then we'll get into units, their economy, their technology tree, and then we'll cover the two starts for cafe. So right now, um, I just just getting that done out of the way to show you the opening move for this one. This is Mao Ying, the Storm Dragon. But let's get into it. So cafe from the initial Total Warhammers three to Immortal Empires is different, very different. Um, I'm not sure if I'm a big fan of the changes or not. So first off, you no longer have the annoying race for the souls, which is a relief. Um, hardly tell you how happy I am about that. But um, the Fae has been shifted. If you remember before, it was a little bit more like this, right? Well, it is now properly aligned. So the Lord of the Western provinces down here is uh, down here is actually in the West rather than the uh, Southeast. And the ruler of the North Provinces is now in the North. So here you've got your Great Bastion. It is held by a faction that will very quickly be your ally. They tend not to lose the Great Bastion in my experience. Very rarely will it get breached. So it's not really a problem for you. At some point you'll want to confederate them and get control of it. But until then, forget about it. Instead you're going to be fighting internal threats. Cathay has been infiltrated by... Um, Rebel Lords, Skaven, and far over to the east, you've got Dark Elves. To the south, you've got Vampires. Thankfully, it's not a legendary vampire faction. So, Cathay has two, three, three major mechanics. The first one is the Great Bastion threat. Even though I've said Great Bastion is not a threat, this will build up. When it does, the Kurgan Warband and other people will spawn and try and take the gate. In my experience, the AI can actually hold the gate. If this game gets balanced, I imagine that will change. Maybe they will ruin the snake gate like in um, the initial Souls Race mode. And um, they're calling it Lost Guy God now. So anyway, keep an eye on that. Um, it gives you a bit of a warning. Holding these gates is crucial. Otherwise, you have to fight rather powerful warbands. Um, the gates are very strong. They upgrade. They get great defensive units. You'll probably have already played them before, so I won't go into it too much. The next mechanic is Harmony, which again, you might know, but I'll cover it again here. Ying versus Yang. Different lords that you recruit have a Ying or Yang status. When recruited, they will alter your Harmony status. In this case, plus three towards Ying, and these would be plus three towards Yang. Also, various buildings you build. Thankfully, none of your recruitment buildings or unique buildings in it's your defensive garrison buildings can change it by one or your economy growth and recruitment buildings can also alter it as well it's important to note that if you build this building um for example the building next to it will get locked the building next to it will be locked you can only build one from each of these two columns imagine them as pairs you can only build one of each thankfully harmony does not change form now if harmony goes one way in this case, we're towards Ying. You get bonus cafe. You get growth and constructions, but you lose penalty towards Ying. And it changes as you get less and less out of balance. If it's balanced, you get bonuses towards construction, growth, relations, income, control, anti-corruption. You get a rather powerful army ability. Don't be afraid of harmony falling out of place. Yes, it's very powerful and you would like to keep it balanced, but you're not going to be able to, especially if you're conquering. Because as you conquer provinces, you might conquer some that have a yin or a yang, and they'll throw you out. The goal is to stay around balance and try and work your way back to it when you can. This means you might take towards building buildings in pairs, building a yang building here, building a yin building here. Just like that, they've counterbalanced each other. And thankfully, it tells you where your yin and yang balances are coming from. For characters, yin right now, events, buildings, technology, it will tell you. Technology also changes it. Suffice to say, you have a northern line, which is yang. Research that, yang grows. 
Bottom one is yin, yin grows. The middle is mostly neutral with a bit of yin and yang to either side. We will cover technology later in a different chapter setting. So how they play. Cathay is a slow faction. They're not particularly overly aggressive, although they can be. They're not particularly overly defensive unless you're defending the Great Bastion. They can do both fairly well. They are a faction that has very solid base units. Their Jade Warriors and Jade Crossbowmen are amazing. Their Jade Warriors fully upgraded are great. But where they truly shine is their high level stuff. And we'll cover units later. But they expand, they take a land, they upgrade it, trying to keep their harmony in balance. Now, that is when you're outside of Cathay. Inside Cathay, I recommend Rapid Conquest if possible. You do not want the Skaven or the Dark Elves to expand and get a real foothold in your land. Instead, you want to be the one to control Cathay. Ideally, you control it along with Mao Ying's brother down here. The Lord of the Western Provinces is your ally slash potentially conquer him or confederate him. And you want to keep the Great Bastion stable. So just be aware if this is breached, rush to fill it in. Now, they have two other mechanics, one of which is relatively simple. It's a caravan. Um, this was in the base uh, base Souls Race game as well. Uh, it's gotten a little bit different now because you've got a larger map in different factions. Basically, you've got a caravan with a lord with a handful of units. You can choose how much money you want to invest. And when it reaches its objective, say we send it to Drakenfeld, when it reaches there, we will get 4,000 gold. If it reaches there, it will be attacked and harassed along the way. You can change the route the caravan takes to try and avoid areas where you're more likely to die. And the game does give you some indication once you know the route, which is going to be a dangerous route or not. Um, it will also take attrition as you march through various provinces. So trying to keep it away from chaos and vampire lands can be good. So I recommend the southern route is probably going to be your safest route for some time. The northern route, though, tends to sometimes can bring you more money. Once you reach a destination, sending another caravan there for a while is less effective get various events and your leader of your caravan can level up i recommend you take the replenishment on him as a whole free line here caravan masters i recommend you get hidden stores pretty much as fast as you can um all the way up to what you get to level eight mainly because it replenishes in foreign territory which means your caravan won't get war uh, worn down by it's all its battles to defend itself um there's quite a few other ones double movement Will of Dragons, Tactician, upgrading all of those. Wayfinders is nice. An Ogre Ambush, even level 1 makes a huge difference. Uh, basically, this is a long-term investment. If you get a strong caravan with 20 units fully upgraded, you'll start making tons of money. Otherwise, it's a bit of a gamble. Losing a caravan hurts. Losing a fully upgraded caravan can be devastating, but it's going to be a massive source of income. In fact, it's going to be your main source of income. Um... And we'll talk more about income later. But suffice to say, you want to use it pretty much constantly. You can have one caravan going at a time. We build it up and dispatch it off. And it will start to move across the map. You can't interfere with it, but you can see it on the map. Now, in terms of the last mechanic, this one links slightly with the Great Bastion. It is the compass. This, again, makes a return from the Souls Race. Basically, you can select one of these four directions and different effects will occur. For example, if we focus on this one, it will grow faster, increased income, winds of magic have a chance of increasing. If we focus here, you'll see all the various effects. The top ones are the passive ones, the bottom ones are ones that when they focus. Ones you want to be aware of is Warpstone Desert is great for controlling Cathay early on because it weakens enemies in the area or the whole region. And it controls corruption. And fighting the Skaven and vampires, this is kind of what you want to be on. Plus it will purge their corruption as well. Now, before you get there though, you probably want to leave it on Celestial Lake. To get the growth bonuses. If you're defending the Great Bastion, focusing on the Great Bastion is really good. It also lowers the rate at which the threat to the Great Bastion grows. Very powerful. And you also get Celestial Intervention, which is a huge enemy bombardment one which can also help with your conquest initial conquest of Cathay. in fact one of the starting things you should do is probably turn on great bastion or warpstone desert before you do the two battle uh, that i did at the beginning of this video 
If your Great Bastion is under threat and you're afraid you can't defend it, putting on Emperor's Wrath, you build it all up, you trigger this, it will kill everything outside the Great Bastion for three turns. Um, and it'll basically stop any threat to the Great Bastion. If the Great Bastion is constantly under threat, leaving this on is good. I have not found the Great Bastion and be under immense threat in this with either of the two characters I've played. So that is how Cathay plays. So let's talk about their units. They is, again, yin yang focused. So they have units that focus, that have focuses towards yin, and they gain bonuses where they're yang units. Usually, ranged units are yin, melee units are yang, as a rule of thumb. And uh, you want to keep them around it. So basically, you're going to have a front line of infantry backed up by a back line of ranged units, and potentially artillery or monsters nearby. The weakness of Cathay is they don't really have any great cavalry. Other than that, they cover everything else immediately well, mediumly well. They're similar to the Empire uh, in how they play. They can adapt to a lot of circumstances, but they don't particularly excel at anything. So let's jump right into it. Your first things you're going to be able to build are just from your settlements. Build peasant long spears and peasant archers. They are not bad units. They're not good units, but they're not bad. They have their place. And more, most importantly, they are what the game considers to be expendable. There you go. They're expendable. So if they die or they route, nearby units that are not expendable themselves will not route as well. So they can prove to be a pretty nice meat shield or just to round out your armies without weakening the rest of your army. If you can't fully support an army of good units, by all means, bring some peasants. They're reasonably cheap to maintain, and you can recruit them at high level using certain buildings. The meat and potatoes of Cathay, though, comes from their barracks. They have Jade Warriors. These are going to be your standard infantry for quite some time. They're defensive. They're not great at offensive. They're armored. They're shielded. They tend not to die. They stay in formation. They do very well in a defensive stance where they resist charge, have armors, if they stand still for a while so you don't want to move them around the battle and their job is to be in front of the ying archers they gain bonuses melee attack and defense if you do. really good you want to use it they're going to be your front line level two is the jade warrior crossbowmen these are going to be your standard ying unit they're reasonably good they have good range they hit hard they're armored they're shielded they actually hold up half decent well in melee combat and again, they get buffed if they're near gang units, having increased range, speed, and leadership. And if they stand still, again, they get charged with armor. The next level three of the barracks is where you start to shift away from your initial ones. You get Jade Warriors with ah, Halibards. No. My mouth did not want to say that word. Uh, and uh, they are an upgrade to your Jade Warriors. The downside is they are not shielded so they tend to die more to range but they're good against fighting enemy monstrous units you have i recommend bringing several of them they're way more effective at killing things than jade warriors because they're armor piercing they're not as good at defending so you don't want to fully neglect the jade warriors they have their place then you have the jade warrior crossbowmen with shield shields it's basically the same unit more expensive the shield really not much else changes basically it. they're a just straight up upgrade once you get them you want to use them they can handle themselves in ranged battles against almost every faction their only weakness is they are not armor penetrate be aware they are good against unarmored units they won't die they'll kill lots of them they can actually fight half decent well then you have got your cab units You've got your peasant horsemen which are not bad they're expendable they're not particularly great though Next level, you have Jade Lancers, which are a bit more shock cav. Uh, they're better. I don't find them amazingly useful. I find Cathay is much better as an infantry range faction, but it's worth bringing one or two of them to route unit. And finally, we upgraded, you get Flying Cav. They're solid. They do a fair amount of damage. They can fly. They hit hard. They cause fear. The only weakness is the odds of them being around a Ying unit is less than likely unless you're using them at. Um, Front lines on their own. Um, they also are ranged, just be aware that range, they are flying, which means range units 
mainly their enemy. Uh, they're good for flank. I tended to just stick with Jade Lancers if they used Cav at all. Next stuff is um, your Forge, where you get your artillery tape. You've got a Iron Hail Gunners, which is a close quarter missile unit. It's kind of hard to describe. It's like they have got blender buses rather than muskets, so they shoot less, they hit hard, they do armor piercing. They're not that great. They're okay at their job, which is riding armor piercing, which your crossbowmen do not have. If you're fighting heavily armored warriors of chaos, you need these guys. Next level, you get crane gunners. They're much, a much greater improvement than iron hail gunners. They have a further range. They're also armor piercing as well. And they are shield breaker, which means when they hit enemies, the enemy has a lower chance of blocking their attack. They're really useful. The long range allows them to be set up and they shoot. They're similar to almost like Skaven guns, but they shoot slower. It doesn't say Iron Hail Gunners aren't useful. They are in their own way, but I prefer these guys when I'm setting up long range artillery. Honestly, Cathay plays similar to the Dwarves, to be honest. Then you got your Grand Cannon, which is your first long range artillery unit. Take one of these to almost every fight. It's a siege thing. It's hard. It's from far away. Forces the enemy to come to you. Then you've got your fire rain rocket, which is similar to the hail storm battery that the Empire has. Although I find it slightly less effective. They've got lower ammunition, uh, slightly lower range. They hit hard. They cause the enemy to come to you. One of these can obliterate an enemy regiment if they get a good attack. Then you've got what's kind of unique to Cathay, which kind of comes out of the Tomb Kings um, stuff, is you get... Actually, no, this is not where it comes out of the Tomb Kings. My apologies. You have your Celestial Dragon Guards, which are just a flat upgrade from your Jade Warriors. Once you get to this, you're going to use them. They are monumentally expensive. They're like 80 or 90 or more gold upkeep. But they are significantly better. They have everything you could want, including shields, they pierce enemy armor because they have halibards. They're good at defense. They're good at offense. They're really hard to kill. Then the next level, you have the Celestial Dragon Crossbowmen. This is a level 5 settlement to get them. Be aware of that. They are armor piercing, which now gives you a long range crossbowman armor piercing. You need them. The next thing we have is the Skyports. The Cathay has flying units that can attack. These are worth bringing. You always want to have one or two of these in your army just so that they can barrage from a distance above the enemy. Um, they do have some weaknesses in that they can't defend themselves against other flying units. Not that Cathay fights too many flying units. It's not like Warriors of Chaos or the Skaven are known for flying units. Um, just be aware that they will lose in the area. Um, they will affect enemies on the map, your allies on the map, with more leadership and ability to see in the forest, which is great. They're always flying. They cannot land, uh, which means they can't capture things. They can shoot while moving, and they get a buff near other units. Not that they're going to be near too many other units. It's just worth mentioning. And they also amplify harmony bonuses so that your units beneath them will get bonus. And the next one is the Sky Junk, which is pretty close to just a general flat upgrade. It does more damage, hits from further, uh, has very similar effects to the one below it. Uh, they can also drop a bomb that does a lot of damage. A good technique is flying over the enemies and bombing them that way. Now, there we go. I knew I was missing. Something. There we go. So then there is one other line, which could of course only be built at your capital settlements because it starts at level three um, and not anywhere else, which is a little odd because you should be able to build the first one. This is your Celestial Towers. You can get Astromancers, which are the mages of Cathay. They are um, they are good at what they do. They cast a variety of spells. They can steal technology. They're just generally worth having one in your armies. Support it. Cathay, Cathay's heroes aren't amazing, really, let's be honest. Um, they also have Alchemist, which is a Metallurgy Mage. Um, that comes from the same place. You get the sky, the sky port. You get the first sky lantern. I find these guys are much more offensive than the astromancers, who are a little bit more buff. Then the next level, 
is you can get a war compass, which is a magical chariot. Um, it has the very interesting mastery of the elemental winds. And if you have two or more units, it increases the power of the spells that are cast. It's kind of neat. Um, it also increases power recharge. Uh, it has spells. It can cast its celestial comet and celestial lightning um, without using up uh, magic points. You can just cast it. Um, it's rather nice. Be aware that it's not really that great in melee. It's not meant to be. It's meant to buff your magic use. And then finally, you get one of the most iconic things of Cathay. You get a Terracotta Sentinel straight out of the tomb. They're large. They hit hard. They don't die. They're a monster unit. Uh, once you get them, have one in almost every army. It will pay for itself. Just be aware that heroes and other units that can burn these guys down tend to focus them. They do well. These guys are great against large amounts of armored units. Dwarves or heavily armored warriors of chaos, they will do a great job again. Let's talk the economy. So, I've already mentioned caravans, and that's going to be one of the largest sources of Cathay's income. You pretty much always want a caravan going unless you're actively at war with somebody on your borders that has tons of lands. So, the ogres could be an issue. Um, the other lord, the lord of the western provinces, has a buff caravans. Um, just mentioning that here. Uh, the actual income of Cathay is kind of bad. They have basically two income buildings. and They're forced to choose between them. They have one that boosts your trade ability, which if you're playing the other lord, Western Provinces, you might want to take more than the Lady of the Northern Provinces because he is more likely to trade and have trading alliances with people. Um, Cathay tends to get a lot of trading alliances with people to the west of them. Uh, you can trade all the way to the empires, the vampires, the dwarves, the ogres even will trade with you. If you got a lot of those, this will buff them. Otherwise, you're stuck with the trade exchange, which is just a flat 300 gold. First level one, though, it's 475 gold. You get 100. It's a five turn payback, which is relatively low. Um, still, it's one of your few sources of income. A good portion of Cathay's income actually comes from their settlements. Um, as they build them up, they become more effective. Now, they can also buff them by taking the parlor of their civic street, which boosts income from all buildings by 6%. If you've got a large province, you can build two or three of them. In this case, is four of them, so that could be an additional, you know, order income from those buildings. Your tech also can buff them as well. I tend to, if you're going to use this one, you want to build this in combination with the trade exchange, stack those two together. Honestly, you probably want to build this all the time over the lumber mill. The only reason you build the lumber mill early on is to grow your growth. This one has less growth. Well, it has the same amount of growth, but it doesn't have the discounted cost of buildings. In reality, just don't build the lumber camp. Build the tea parlor. Probably build Ware's Market unless you're going to focus on trade. The last thing they have, and it's not really the economy, but I will mention it because it does have something of an effect on it. You can build a conscription office. This one Fully upgraded, it allows you to get level 6 Peasant Spears and Longbowmen. It also gives you Control, which you probably will need as Cathay in general. Um, Cathay does not have a lot of Control options. Um, they shouldn't have tons of Control problems, but you may have to build one of these regardless. Uh, in which case, this one will give you 5, the other one will give you 3. I don't tend to use peasant long spears and peasant archers if i can the jade warriors and then the uh the celestial dragon guard units are much better than the peasants but if you're going to use a lot of them you could fill an entire great bastion with a bunch of cheap units and recruit them right nearby and it might be worth using if you also need control this is the building to build otherwise you want to build the conscription lodge in, which decreases the cost of peasant long spearmen and peasant archers to almost nothing fully upgraded. 80% discount is nuts. More importantly, though, it does give some control. But the big thing I use it for is the casualty replenishment rate. Again, Cathay does not have an immense casualty replenishment rate. So having a building that buffs it a bit is very useful. So what you want to do is once you control your two provinces, you'll have edicts you can issue. The only one that gives you any economy is the Sea Dragon's Edict, which if you're trading a lot, this will again buff it as well. Otherwise, 
probably Fire Dragon's Edict will help. They actually muster your armies. And the rest are pretty self-explanatory. If I've got nothing going on, stick it on the research rate. It will help your economy more in the long run than five trade income. Higher tax, better tax. So let's talk technology of Cathay. Cathay's technology is very similar to what it was in States. In fact, virtually identical. So you've got, of course, as I mentioned, three different paths. The middle one, if you stay perfectly in the middle, you will not have any change in your harmony. If you go north, you'll affect the yang. If you go south, you'll affect the yin. You want to get the yin and yang abilities, but what you'll spend a lot of time doing if you're in harmony is researching Gang, jumping over and research gang. I find it might even be a better strategy to build a gang building and start reaching ying technologies to balance it out, and do a yang building and then uh, ying building and then yang technology. It's up to you. Try to want to stay in harmony. Don't kill yourself if you're not in It's really not that big of a problem. Some important things to note is I recommend trying to get dragon scales early on if you can you're fledging mentors into dragon scales that will give more armor to your jade warriors all types of them and it will give you more ammunition things that help quite a lot in early battle world chaining if you're going to use peasants snag this if not no. jade stance is worth getting because it reduces the vigor loss meaning your units fight better for longer up here you've got a harmonic balance which boosts your yang industry buildings Remember how each building has yin or yang? Depending on what you're building, you want to research this tech. If you're researching yin, you don't want to as much. And uh, if you're going to use cav, snag this. Otherwise, you really wouldn't even head all the way up there. This one's important, though, because it gives a decrease of upkeep to your yang armies. Each army has their leader is yin or yang. Decrease 10% is pretty nice. Down here, same thing, but for Ying, and you get a ba banner. I would, however, take defensive formations regardless of what you're doing, or melee defense for standard infantry units is really useful. Okay, up here, aggression, melee attack while attacking, defense while defending, stack these two together, your units are going to have eight, at least melee defense. You can start getting like 15 to 16 melee defense boosts on them if they're defending with archers nearby. It's pretty crazy. If they against overwhelming odds. Blessed Temple Guardians worth grabbing. You need to to get to administrative subsidies anyway. Grab it. The corruption reduction. Again, got other stuff. I don't recommend really researching these later ones. You're probably not going to sack much. You're probably not going to... Well, Sky Lanterns is worth it if you're going to go that way. Speed, okay. Eh. I'd much rather have Harmonic Mastery. The income, dance, the boost peasant long spearman unit if you're going to use them this makes them a lot better and the ying hex here makes the enemy heroes succeed less against you you don't need to research um, these you can just go straight through the middle i tend to do that for these come back finishing later later on boosts your lord's ranks improves your range and damage of your crossbowmen always worth snagging inner strength boost your armies that are yang it's good Reduce construction time, always solid. LA attack. Basically, the first, this whole section here you want to research. Later on, up here, increase recruitment rank and maintenance of your Jade Warriors. Get it. Even though you want to use the Dragon's Guard, once you're expanding, you're not going to be able to build more of them. So being able to get Jade Warriors, which is a level one infantry unit, is really worth it. Plus, if you're going to use Sentinel, we're snagging that as well. Further on there, replenishment rate for Yang armies and movement, always a good thing. And if you're going to use these, I really don't feel the need to grab them, but the Wu Ying compass resistance is nice. And if you can flank, always a good thing. Further down here, Moonwood, reduce destruction time, always a solid thing. Rapnel, increased damage from hail gunners. If you use them, it's worth getting. Otherwise, snag this for increased Jade Warrior discounts. Good thing. Heroes, you're not going to probably use much of them. This one's worth it if you use Grand Cannons. Here, Ambush, success chance up. I always take this one because I like using ambushes. AIs fall for them a lot, and even players do a fair amount. Up here, if you go through the middle, Astromancers get stronger. Yeah. Peasants, this one's nice. 
control increases in your provinces where you have an army if you just stick a single lord basically in a settlement plus two order it can keep your lands happy if you have any revolt problems up here increase replenishment for peasants if you're using them i don't use them down here stock for archers come on it's not even worth mentioning sea dragon edicts increase income from capitals always a good thing to trade just go straight up the middle there forges increase infantry great alchemist okay movement range resistance basically snag the ones that are useful the further away from the middle you get usually the more specialized they become and you just want to keep going control in all all provinces is amazing corruptible reduce plague bonus while fighting demons punishment rate for terracotta sentinels is good if you're going to use them decrease cooldown on the compass and then finally the blessing reduce upkeep recruit rank is amazing to get it especially because it gives you winds of power magic reserve increase per turn which is something very rare it means you're gonna have lots of magic in your army and other than that figure out what you're gonna do the later stuff here the upkeep and the replenishment are really nice so that is it for the technology let's get into the start locations so if you think back to the beginning of the video you'll remember i started with an army fought a battle and then conquered the settlement those are the first things you want to do is now now Ying, the storm dragon the lord of the lady of the northern provinces she's good at fighting chaos has more ammo reduced corruption she is the ranged one of the two okay for starting settlement starts with a training camp you want to upgrade that so you can get the jade warrior crossbowman uh and then what you do next is a little bit up to you um i tend to defend my capitals by sticking a garrison in them if i can the odds of in this case, your capital getting attacked are slim to none unless the bastion falls. In which case, it might be worth snagging a growth building and infant. Um, or you could start getting your iron gunner. In my opinion, grabbing the iron gunner, starting down your artillery range tree, probably worth it. Especially if you can get great cannons early on. Once you take your new settlement, you're probably going to want to replenish any jade warriors you might have lost. You want to wait a couple turns, build up, keep going east, this settlement, this settlement, and they have another one up here. Then further south, there's a solitary greenskin settlement. I recommend you race down and take it. Once you do, the Skaven and Eshin, which is located down here, will probably attack you. Take them out, take them out, take them out. At that point, they'll probably either be dead, they'll have expanded into the western desert. Time to go after them do so you want to wipe out the skaven once they're gone there's no more skaven as a threat located to the south is the lord of the western provinces now yao ying's brother who she didn't like particularly much um you by and large get a non-aggressive act trade defensive he's worth keeping around until you can confederate them and get two legendary lords plus your cafe so you kind of guys all get along in terms of mao ying's actual stats she can transform dragon which is great she can't cast spells really though um, she does have the wrath of the storm which is really nice nearby intensely her trade is the supreme matriarch her missile infantry units are dirt cheap showing again that she's leader and she's a ying as well she's pretty good at fighting even more in her dragon form uh it makes her significantly stronger but she is a mage so her things lot of healing and buffs that with earth blood and life bloom you can heal good chunks of your army rather quickly my missile mirror is nice if you're fighting units with range but you really shouldn't be unless you let the skaven build up so they get their artillery most everything else in the area through the dark elves might have some not a huge problem um, i should mention that once you kill off clan eshin at that point the dark elves on the coast here uh rakat uh, is it uh i can't remember the lokir felhart i believe is over here he will probably expand to you and do you want to go finish him off down here there's a vampire faction which actually hilariously likes you i would still kill them regardless you don't want the corruption after that you can either force your way further south or start expanding into the mountains of the ogres or if you're crazy, you could go invade the Chaos Waste. I find the Great Bastion holds. 
in terms of her skills. I'm sorry, I got a bit converted there. Um, you want to boost her healing to the first you do so that she can heal her army, keep them alive longer. It's up to you. I tend to do Life Bloom and Earth Blood as my first two. That way we get large chunks of individual units and uh, your army as a whole. If you're going to personally fight battles, this is okay. Next, you want to go down the blue line. I recommend Root Marcher. Probably Fervent rather than anything else. Soul's not a problem if you've got an army. Recruitment is nice if you feel the need for armies are expensive. Reassuring Presence, relatively useful. I'd put three points into Fervent, one into maybe Inspiring Recruitment, if anything. If you want Irrepressible, and then you want to get Logician, hold that up. And this might change, but Logician and then probably Quartermaster, at least one level, unlock the Great Bastion. Always finish off Quartermaster later to make your army cheaper. Afterwards, I wouldn't buff her melee skills. She's a spellcaster and her dragon form is pretty strong. I could do the red line because Kothais is so into its defensive formations, buffing for Jade Warriors and uh, guard units with more attack and defense is great, as well as buffing her range. Additional range is always good. When she hits level 12, she can do her Aura of Majesty. It's worth getting. It affects errors around them. Um, if you turn her into her dragon form, the enemies nearby have a melee defense. And also great. Harmonious. Relations with Cathay. Control. Corruption. Sure. Got the Great Bastion. Snag this one. Otherwise, ignore it. Master of Storms, it's nice because it helps you cast more healing spells and other of the life tree of magic. Opposing Chaos, if you're fighting Chaos, snag it. Ward save, melee defense is amazing. Range, always good. Um, I'd almost snag this over opposes Chaos and some directly fighting tons of Chaos armies. Persistent Fire or Archery, Eye of the Storm, always a great one. Huge buff in the area to your units and everything. That's about it. It's not an amazingly interesting skill tree. Have fun with it. I imagine it'll get something of a balance. At On to the other lord. Okay, here we are with Zhao Ming, the Iron Dragon, Lord of the Western Provinces. So we're actually a chunk of the way into it. I wanted to show you kind of what the area around you looks like. So we'll just start about that. You start with Qiang. Down here, it is not a capital province. You want to get one as soon as you can. It has a Jade Barracks building. You want to upgrade it. I recommend throwing a garrison building in it because if for some reason you get attacked by Gorse right here, Ogres, this is the first place they're going to hit once they get to today. You want to move up and take Hanyu Port. There'll be a quick Skaven battle there. Beat them. Stay in your lands. Recruit. Next turn, march in. Take the port. Port is good because it grows. It gives you some money. Want to upgrade it eventually put a garrison in it just to make sure that anything down from the mountain it can't take it after that there will be a ruin up here it's not a ruin and hint it's by the skaven you want to build up march in take them out once you've taken them out you'll again still be fighting um defector lords the ones you fought down here you've got to finish them off so it naturally will lead you up into the desert be aware that marching through this area will give you attrition you either need to complete your marches through force marches to stay out of the desert or march while in the encampment stance and move and it makes you attrition your starting army as long as you keep it buff keep this fire rain rocket alive if you can and create longmore riders keep building it up don't care about losing jade warriors or especially any peasant units take shan yang first if you can capital settlement I do recommend going up and getting Shrine of the Alchemist before coming back for Taizu. Reason being is that sometimes the rebel lords that you fought up here will send their army to fight ogres and it will come back this way. I'm going to try and catch it and wipe it out before it returns to the settlement. The last thing you want to fight is, an, is a city with an army in it if you can avoid it. Take Shrine of the Alchemist, march back, take them out. Make sure to get a non aggression and trade a pact with the sister to the north, the northern province dragon lady. Keep her happy. At this point, and I paused right here just so you could see, you've got potential allies to the south here. They like you. They really like you. 
be friends with them. Over here is the vampires. At some point, you're going to want to wipe them out. But first comes the necessity of killing Clan Eshin. They are right here. They're also right here. Take them out, finish them off. Pick out that green skin settlement that I reminded people lurked right here. The Dim Tongue. Must be a reference to Dim Tongue. Pick them out, at which point you'll probably have to keep moving to fight uh, Blessed Dread. Kill them off. Pick out any other rebels, various skavens. Then I'd recommend if you can march south. Pick out the vampire rebels, the Jianxi rebels. At which point the Fey will be mostly subdued. You've got a choice: either go south and deal with, oddly enough, some wood elves down here, um, and just fully finish off the people of the Fey, or you could start moving west. If you're gonna move west, be aware that this guy. Find him. He gets along well with ogres. He has a uh, trait here. Once you get level 12, you can unlock it. Lord of Shang Yang. Plus 40 relations with the ogre kingdoms. There is no reason for you to kill the ogres as this guy. By and large, if you get a non aggression pact with them and you own all their provinces on all the provinces on their border, as in don't let Yao Ying border them. Uh, they will not attack Cathay, and they will be good buffers against Chaos. Um, and plus, you can trade with them, and they will less likely to harass your caravans. So, let's go over his stats since I've got it open. First off, you don't want to go down the blue line. You don't want to go down this line. You want to snag these. Up here, you've got these abilities unlocked immediately. Boosted melee attack, boosted melee strength, boosted armor, which is amazing. This guy is the melee lord. And then a ward save in an area. It's up to you. I recommend the warding iron, and the desert armor, then iron strength, then desert weapons. This will just make your melee units significantly stronger. It'll make the first battles much easier. Other Cathay, the Skaven are a joke, so don't even really worry about them. At which point, you'll either get close enough that you'll be able to start unlocking the Masters of Metal and other abilities. I recommend all three of these. Are great this one allows regeneration and armor piercing for your army which is great um over here though you've got a bit of a choice which you take you can take one of these i don't recommend the poison one and uh i think you're better off taking either flaming and magical attacks more than anything else mainly because if you're gonna go west you'll probably fight the horse and zombies these attacks Will help again plus you get some magic it's just not as strong as this one is other than that he is a metal using lord so you get access to most of the magic spells along with the dragon breath spell which is kind of nice worth using and uh he gets final transmutation which is great if you're going to fight horse because you can target and delete words with it constellation of the dragon is really fun if you and uh, he is a magic caster. He's also pretty good at melee. I don't feel the need to upgrade his melee stats because you can turn him into the dragon and be powerful as well. Boosting his melee units, again, solid. But I do recommend before you do all that, you go down here, get Logician, Quartermaster, the Great Bastion. Up. Unlike his sister, you don't have to worry about the Great Bastion. She'll take care of it or it won't have any trouble whatsoever. So your job is to subdue, annex, confederate your whole way through Southern Cafe. And then if you want, you can go pick a fight with vampires and ogres over here. Why you want to fight the ogres, I don't know. I've got defensive alliances and non-aggression packs with basically all of them. And uh, I played another 80 or 90 turns of the campaign. I never had trouble with the ogres. I was left alone to build up and progress towards pretty easy victory conditions, honestly. All I have to do is get the Ivory Road here, an ally, and then take or loot 30 settlements. Honestly, you're almost better marching through the Ogre Lands, fighting the Greenskins, Skaven, the Dwarves, and the High Elves over here. Leave the Ogres as a buffer. And your homeland's pretty secure. Do the same thing with the Compass, Growth, Damage, Leadership early on afterwards. Honestly, you could set it to the Dragon Emperor's Wrath to keep killing off everything. Nothing gets to the Bastion. Not a hard faction. Probably will be balanced and changed. Anyway, 
that is Cafe. Hopefully this has helped you guys as understand how they play in Immortal Empires. It's slightly different than the Race of Souls. A little bit less land, a little bit less of a problem defending. More about trade and getting along with people than before. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please do leave a like if you watched all of this. Please do subscribe if you haven't. There'll be more guides and other various strategy games. And I hope to see you all in another video. Leave a comment as well. And bye for now.